on this episode of Therapy Bites Art Lab. Hey guys, welcome once again to Therapy Bites Art Lab. And today we're going to talk about the magic of making matters worse. Did you know that reality is not constructed out there? Reality is constructed where? Right inside of the vault of your own brain. Today we'll talk about how we can make matters better or how we can make matters worse just based on how we decide to think about things. Join us on the episode coming up. Welcome to Therapy Bites Art Lab, where Dr. Heath and his special guests share real life stories of helping and healing. Fresh from the actual therapy couch while taking a bite out of common counseling missteps and misconceptions. And now, here's Heath and the T-Ball team. And we're going to talk about making some magic in your life, but sometimes the magic is more of a curse because we as humans have the power to utilize the magic of making matters worse or the magic of making matters better. Which way are you choosing to sculpt out, to carve out the reality in your life? Imagine that you have a special knife. You know, Philip Pullman wrote a book that I love, and in that book he talks about the subtle knife. Well, imagine that you have a subtle knife, a very sharp knife, and you get to sculpt out how your reality for the day is going to be. And as I heard an uh, old gentleman say one time, in the mornings you get to get out of bed. I think he was a minister. He said, you get to get out of bed and say, oh me, or amen. Amen literally means so be it, by the way. And what is it that you're saying? And we have today in the art lab our very special, not guest, but our T-ball team. And we have Sarah, and she's running our control. She's our tech expert, our other tech expert, our graphics queen is Heather. And then Debbie is helping us run the show from her end of things, doing a lot of editing and a lot of proofing. It, You know, as I say, it takes a village to raise a child. It takes a whole team to do a podcast, and we're very (laughs) proud of our T-Ball team. And we thank you for being part of the T-Ball team. Let me give a shout-out to our community breakfast that we have every Saturday, by the way. Uh, If you would like to join our T-Ball Community Breakfast, all you have to do is text T-Ball, that's T-B as in ball, (laughs) A-L to 1-870-686-4196. That's 870, you ought to put a one in front of it, 1-870-686-4196. That's complimentary. There's no membership fee. We just get together every Saturday, 9 a.m. Central Time. That's Chicago time. Uh, I said uh, CST to a gentleman the other day, and he said, you know, that's China Standard Time because he was in China. And I thought, well, gosh, I'll have to start saying that's uh, Chicago time also. But uh, text T-Ball to one 686 4196 and then you can celebrate your weekly wins with the whole t-ball community we look forward to you being there okay let's talk about the magic of making matters worse and what has been your experience ladies in that area something that i hear often and i confess i've done this myself (laughs) is having the having the mindset of well i would rather think about the worst case scenario so that that way you know when it's not as bad as i thought it would be you know that'll be that'll be better than not being prepared for the worst thing that could happen. Am I the only one that's heard that or thought that way? Yeah, no, I, I've <laughs> definitely heard that too. <laughs> yeah. I, I, that I first uh, heard that in an episode of Bewitched. Uh, oh. <laughs> Elizabeth uh, Montgomery, was it? Yeah, uh, Elizabeth Montgomery. And, and as a kid, that was one of my favorite shows. It was, it was kind of a funny show. And she had uh, magicked Benjamin Franklin from the 1700s Gosh, I guess to the, what was that, the 1970s. And he said that. He? he said that uh, he likes to live such that, uh, gosh, what was the quote? That he imagines the very worst, and then if something else happens, he can be pleasantly surprised. Yeah. The question is, what's wrong with that? Is there anything wrong with that? What, what's the downside of that? You're fretting. 
over yeah. stuff that's not even happened and like yeah. kind of blowing it out of proportion using those cognitive distortions like catastrophizing and mm -hmm. um, fortune telling fortune telling yeah yeah, yeah i mean it, it, it's about as if you would sit around since it is possible to have a house fire <laughs> and as the meme goes ain't nobody got time for that <laughs> uh, <laughs> as if there's a house fire and you are telling your brain every moment there could be a house fire that starts. There could be a house fire that starts. There could be a house fire that starts. Mm -hmm. And what Heather's pointing out, I think that we're going to get to, and, and yes, we will get to it, is what's the neuroscience behind the magic of making matters worse? What's the <laughs> neuroscience behind it? And I love teaching people how to be better programmers, better engineers of what your brain does, and here's a phrase that we try to post on everything. We first program our thoughts, and then our thoughts program our lives. I think we use the word engineer. We first engineer our thoughts, and then, it's a big then, it's a four-letter <laughs> word, uh, then our thoughts engineer our lives. And the question is, what kind of life are we going to decide to uh, engineer? Mm -hmm. um, I, I will tell on myself, as they say in the South, and share a story from just a few days ago where, for whatever goofy reason, I decided to engage in the magic of making matters worse. Uh, I build things. I grew up building things. I grew up building houses with my dad, uh, even working in concrete. Oh, concrete. Uh, no pun intended. That is really hard work. You get it? Concrete, yes, hard, yes. hard work. Okay, well, I do my best. Uh, I went to get some of this concrete at a local place that sells concrete. I, I won't call them out on air, no offense intended. Um, but I went to get the concrete, and a super, super nice young man, so very helpful, uh, kind of odd at the place where I went. You don't actually find a lot of helpful people people at actually this place of business, which is why I'm not calling out the name of the business <laughs> on air. Uh, I don't want to be unnecessarily critical and name them. Uh, but he was super, super nice, just a wonderfully pleasant guy. And I was standing in line to buy other things, and he said, well, do you have more shopping to do? And I said, well, yes. I have to go get uh, two bags of pool salt. And uh, he said, fine, go get your pool salt. I'll start working on your order for your 5,000 pounds of concrete, two and a half tons of concrete. Uh, that is, uh, let me add it up, 62 80 pound bags of concrete. 62 wow. 80 pound That's bags of concrete. concrete. For some reason, in my head, it really sounds better telling myself you only have to unload 62 bags <laughs> instead of you have to unload 5,000 pounds. Yeah. yeah. That just sounds. It does. Difficult. I start to say bad, but just just difficult. <laughs> well, I'm standing in line, and he comes back, and he says, "Well, I've I've gotten your concrete uh, ready to load up. Uh, can you unhook your trailer, uh, or do you want us to put it in the trailer?" And I said, "No, I'll unhook my trailer. You can put uh, whatever it is, three thousand eight hundred pounds of it. Uh, the Ford company is going to send me letters. It's a it's a it's an F two fifty. I had one guy come up and said, you know." I'd be surprised if that Ford, because he's a, a Chevy guy, I'd be surprised <laughs> if that Ford could haul that 3,800 pounds, you know. For, uh, Ford people, Chevy people, Dodge people are always kind of <laughs> kind of dissing on each other, as they say. Uh, but we're going to put 3,800 pounds on the back of this truck, and, and I went to unhook the trailer. And we're about to load it up after I've waited for an hour. At this point... Tick, 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 tick. It has been one hour. But, you know, it's only 8 o'clock at night. Uh, what do I got to do? Oh, I know what I got to do. I got to get home and unload 5,000 pounds of concrete. <laughs> That's what I've got to do. You know, snap, snap. Well, uh, another young lady comes out and says, have you paid for that? And I said, well, no, ma'am, I've not because uh, this gentleman said, can you unhook your trailer? And I got out of line to unhook my trailer. Well, you got to come back in and pay for it. Well, I've got to go back in and get back in line and wait another, what, 30, 40 minutes to pay for the concrete? Uh, do you often have concrete thieves? Uh, I mean, can you imagine 
I abscond with the concrete, all 5,000 pounds of it. And you call the police, hurry, there's a concrete thief leaving the parking lot. Oh, but don't hurry, because the poor guy can only drive 20 miles an hour. By all means, stop and get a donut. He's not going anywhere very quickly. Is this usually a problem? I've not heard of concrete thieves in the paper. Maybe it's a new thing. And as you can tell, what am I doing? What's that magic word? I am catastrophizing. (laughs) Instead of just embracing the experience and thinking, oh my goodness, isn't this going to be a great story (laughs) that I can tell? No, 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 no. I decided to make it as worse as possible on myself by telling myself it was a what? I don't know, a level 10 catastrophe. (laughs) And so what I did is I slowly began to recalibrate my catastrophe scale. And we'll talk about more of that later in the show. Mm-hmm. But that's my story. Uh, what, what, what the story that you guys have about catastrophizing and the magic of making matters worse in your lives? Um, something that always comes to mind that actually came to mind when we were thinking about this uh, topic was, um, you know, little kids. So if you have a little kid and they fall down and scrape their knee, really the way that the parent or the guardian handles it makes a big difference. And I'll tell you what I mean. So if the parent comes up to them and they're like, oh, you know, you're okay, get up, you know, you're not bleeding, you're fine. Or even if you are, let's slap a Band-Aid on it, get right back out there. Then they're they're just like, okay, yeah, sure, let's do it. But if the parent comes up to them and they're like, oh, my gosh, you hurt your knee. Oh, my goodness, you poor thing. Ah, you got to come inside. You can't play anymore. You know, it completely changes the, the kid who was kind of a little bit upset before is now bawling because they think something horrific has happened. You're bleeding out through the knee. I know. Mm-hmm. Huh. Yeah. The humanity, the blood loss. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just something that I've seen um, periodically. But. Well, and that made me think of, it, it was a horrible TikTok trend that was on for a long time um while back but they would have a baby in their arms and then they'd like hit the wall or hit the um chair or just something to make a loud noise and then they'd start petting the baby's head and like oh it's okay it's okay i'm sorry you hit your head and then the baby would start crying and i was like that is so awful but just because of like the way that they were talking to them i guess like they were trying to say that, you know, even if the baby doesn't hit their head, like, you know, it reacts to the coddling and the, the you know, sweet talk. And it's like, it's okay, baby. And they just would start crying. I was like, why would you want to make your child cry? That's awful. Yeah. But when Sarah was talking about how, you know, parents react, it kind of can um, make the situation better or worse. It made me think of that because nothing happened. The baby was fine. Like, mm-hmm. but just from the parents reaction to, mm-hmm. um, they were reacting to their parents reaction. Let's say this is a four year old, a seven year old, or even 11, 12, 13 year old. What do you guys as clinicians think that the long term fallout would be of being reared by a parent that catastrophizes every single scraped knee. What <laughs> what programming does that help the kid engage in? Not wanting to do anything. Catastrophizing. And catastrophizing. Yeah. A big like, Absolutely. I mean, going going off, you know, I'm going to catastrophize for a second about their catastrophizing, but if you think <laughs> about, you know, if they start to feel a little bit sick, you know, instead of, um, trying to really think about it, they're probably going to be like, oh my gosh, I'm sick. I can't go to work. I can't do anything. I got to stay at home. I can't go anywhere, you know, or, yeah. oh, I've hurt myself. I have to go to the ER and maybe they just have a paper cut on their finger or something like that. You know? Exactly. Uh, the, the programming for a human begins really uh, at birth, if not before birth, uh, certainly at birth. And the, the best thing that a parent can do, and sometimes it goes the other way, the worst thing a parent can do is normalizing. Let me go the worst way. Uh, sadly, tragically, uh, there are kids, of course, yes, that are abused, uh, uh, sexually abused, physically abused, and they come to see the world that way. They, they assimilate that into their knowledge banks of their brain, and they come to believe this is just the way it is. If I, uh, uh, people are going to uh, be uh, disrespectful to me, you can just expect it. 
people are going to be abusive to me if I get in a relationship. Uh, that that person's brain over assimilates. Uh, assimilation, a healthy thing. It, it lowers the learning curve. Over assimilation, not a healthy thing. Uh, it just makes life tougher. But people over assimilate. Now the other way is if you teach a kid that every boo boo is a level ten catastrophe, then and I'm going to say this very carefully. Every non-preferred event then becomes a level 10 catastrophe. Mm-hmm. But throughout life, you're going to have lots of non-preferred events. Imagine going through life thinking every one of them is a catastrophe, and we haven't really gotten into uh, all of the neurology with catastrophizing and the magic of making matters worse. But I'll dip a little proverbial toe into it. This is my finger, but I'll dip a little toe into it here. And that is you're really setting up your brain to engage in a whole series, a daisy chains, a, a daisy chain of uh, catastrophic responses, which are really healthy if it's actually a catastrophe. This podcast is HIPAA compliant. No identifying patient information will be disclosed without permission from patients or guardians. All personal stories will be de-identified in order to comply with HIPAA, the NASW Code of Ethics, and the Ethical Principles of Psychologists and Code of Conduct. We like to bring you stories fresh from the therapy couch, and here is a story cobbled together over probably 30 years of my own experience. It's not related to any single patient, but it is something that I hear routinely and even heard today. I ask people where you think Uh, your emotions come from, what is it that manufactures emotions, and what I get is usually it is different events, situations, and circumstances. But think about that for a minute. If you farm out creation of your emotions to things that happen out there, well that by definition puts you out of control. And I ask a uh, person a question recently, I ask people this every day, uh, where is it that you think your emotions come from? And that's what they said. It comes from my emotions come from other people. And I want to encourage you guys, take back your power and realize, like the topic today, your emotions are manufactured directly. And I mean, directly, as we would say in the South, from how you decide to think about events, situations, circumstances. Our emotions are not manufactured by things out there, outside the vault of our skull. Our emotions are manufactured by how we decide to think of things inside the vault of our skull. Something to think about. You are listening to Therapy Bites Art Lab. Bite-sized therapy for your brain with Dr. Heath and the T-Ball Team. The best advice on the net. No copay required. One of my favorite parts of our episodes are our social media debates of the day. And this is actually less of a debate and more of a sincere question that we received on social media. We tackle a lot as one of our HVTs, our high value targets, the terms manipulation and toxicity. They're big pseudo psychological nonsense memes going out. And the question was, uh, what about in cases of abuse? Uh, uh, Do manipulation and toxicity not occur when there's children? And our answer to that was, because we kind of team up on some of these answers, our answer to that was, it really just depends on the age of the child. As a child grows, they develop greater and greater and greater amounts of this important thing, one of the most wonderful things, free will. If you've ever dealt with a teenager, you know that teenagers love to exercise their free will. And so at a certain point, as the human brain ages and matures, the person can engage in more and more of their free will and come to understand that, wait a minute, no one can truly manipulate what's going on inside of my brain. No one can really make my neurons fire in a certain pattern. People grow and mature to the point that they realize I get to decide what I will think. 
That's why at Therapy Bites Art Lab, in the art lab, we teach people that manipulation certainly doesn't exist because if it did, those in Ukraine could leverage it against Putin and he would surrender, or Putin could leverage it against Ukraine and they would surrender, or we would teach all teachers to use it and there would be no discipline problems, uh, or we could let the IRS use it and there'd be no one that refused to pay their taxes because the IRS could manipulate people into paying their taxes. That's why we teach people, take your power back because manipulation is simply a nonsense pseudo-psychological meme that seeks to do nothing but suppress your power of using your free will to take control of your own thoughts. Think about that for a few days and put your comments uh, at the end in our podcast episodes. And we appreciate, as always, you tuning in. Here's Heath and the T-Ball team. And let me throw out a dirty word. Now, it's not a dirty word to most people listening, but this is a dirty word to to my clinician brain. Here's your dirty word. It's not a four-letter word, but it is a four-syllable word. Try this on for size. Uh, Test this out. Experiment with this this week overwhelming mm-hmm. or overwhelmed yeah. but yeah. overwhelming if you go through your day telling your brain oh this was overwhelming and that was overwhelming this other thing was overwhelming uh then what are you telling your brain you're telling your brain to stay on high alert uh mm-hmm. is five thousand pounds of concrete overwhelming no but it is five thousand pounds of concrete mm-hmm. uh and that was in my my little blurb earlier, but uh, 5,000 pounds of concrete, that's heavy, but it's not overwhelming unless it's sitting on my head. Right. Yeah. (laughs) You know, now that would be overwhelming because that would kill me. Mm -hmm. Here's a cool psychology trick. Change your programming by changing your programming language. Instead of saying it is overwhelming, why not try out, well, yeah, that's not my favorite thing to do. That's not my favorite thing to happen. I mean, it's like me eating onions. Yeah, they're not my favorite things. But if somebody puts them on a burger, which I try not to eat a whole lot of burgers, no offense to the burger industry. We don't want the burger industry to sue us. Uh, but, but you should eat them rarely. And I don't mean as the opposite of well done. I mean infrequently. Um, but if you put onions on my burger, uh, I can, yeah. Not my favorite thing. I wouldn't put bur- uh, onions on my burger, but eh, I'll go ahead and eat it. Not my, not the, not the worst thing, but not my most preferred thing. Is it overwhelming? Are the onions going to overwhelm me? Well, no, not, not unless you poison them with antifreeze or something. <laughs> Your new definition, uh, Art Labbers, uh, <laughs> accurate, realistic thinkers, life-affirming believers. That's Art Lab, A-R-T-L-A-B. Uh, Art Labbers, your new assignment your new mission, should you choose to accept it, (laughs) cue the Mission Impossible music, (laughs) is to change your programming by changing your programming language. Start to see things not as overwhelming unless they're going to kill you. Here's a few examples. If you were here at the art lab, we have a pool outside, and and I wouldn't because this would just be rude and illegal. Held your head under water for 15 minutes. Unless you're David Blaine, you will just die because you will drown. Mm-hmm. That is overwhelming. If I were to carry you to the top of this new building that we're finishing and dangle you by your ankle and drop you off on your head, that is overwhelming because you would just die. If I were to put you in a u size microwave and cook you for 15 minutes, you would go <laughs> And that would be overwhelming because there's a graphic picture. It is. It, it's still Halloween for us. This episode's going to drop after Halloween, but you know we try to push out Halloween as long as possible because we love it. Uh, you would go and you would die, uh, and that's overwhelming. Unless it's something that would cause you to die, there's no need in leveraging all that catastrophe equipment that would help you run from a grizzly bear that would help you run from someone with a knife or a gun or a a mummy uh, or a werewolf or a vampire, unless it's going to kill you, really reconsider calling it overwhelming. And I'll get more specific with the neurobiology 
of that, the physiology of that, here in a couple of minutes toward the end of our episode. Uh, so stick around. What are some other catastrophizing events you guys have had in your personal lives? Um, I did one when I was taking my licensure exam because um, in the past, testing has been difficult. And so I was like, well, just prepare for failure. And then if you pass, it's a good thing. And if you fail, then you're not going to be super disappointed. But looking back, it's like, well, that I was prepared. And if like looking back at it, like if I would have um, really looked at and thought about, well, that how that's, you know, kind of just preparing myself for the failure and preparing myself kind of that self-fulfilling prophecy like it's like if you're thinking about well i'm gonna fail anyways it's like well then you've got the mindset of well then why prepare why do this because it's gonna happen it's inevitable but if i would have thought about it and been like well i can pass this this is gonna go great you know i've got this there's not a um you know you can do it then i would have gone in with more confidence rather than having that like seed of kind of uncertainty building because your brain what you're telling your brain uh prepares what comes next and imagine a pro level athlete uh, uh tiger woods on, uh, on on the golf greens before he takes his putt saying you're gonna miss it you're gonna miss it yeah. you're gonna miss it you're gonna miss it you're gonna miss it i guarantee you he does not do that right. he may even have a coach uh historically uh who has taught him not to do this if you're uh, a famous football player and uh uh, uh, uh is and and before you throw the ball you say you're gonna screw it up you're gonna fumble it you're gonna fumble it you're gonna fumble it you're gonna fumble it you're gonna fumble it, gonna fumble it. then you have a higher chance of doing just that Mm -hmm. because you've actually forecast failure right stop Mm -hmm. forecasting for failure Mm -hmm. stop forecasting for failure do an experiment and i've done this experiment with uh kids uh, because we have a basketball court uh, at the art lab and i've taken the kid out there because you know kids will come and they'll say all right this sucks i don't want to come to therapy and i'll say i'll make you a deal we will do uh I don't know, 10 minutes of therapy for every 10 minutes on the ball court. Now, by the way, we're still doing therapy on the ball court, but don't <laughs> tell anybody. Shh, keep that a secret. Uh, we'll do 10 minutes of therapy for every 10 minutes on the ball court, and they're up for that. And uh, I had, I've had i had several kids where I've had them take 10 free throws, and this is experiment. I want you to pretend that you are your favorite NBA ball player. I mean, you are famous you're so good take your 10 uh, shots well they'll do pretty good you know it's a seven out of ten i had a basketball coach that uh, i'll just say he would severely discipline us if we missed a free throw Mm -hmm. because he believed that if you're not being guarded you know exactly where the shot's coming from it's not up in there and by the way i was a horrible basketball player (laughs) Uh, but he believed that there was no reason to miss a free throw Hmm. And uh, it it amazes me all these pros that they miss free throws regularly. I mm-hmm. my coach would just oh he'd be so so devastated he would he would punish them by doing stairs and laps and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> uh, but I'll have these uh, young people take free throws and they'll do pretty good. You know I don't know six out of ten. Some are really good. Some have hit ten out of ten. But here's the twist. At the next interval of therapy of 10 minutes, we would specifically address all the nasty things others have told them. Bullies at school, bullies at home, uh, parents who've engaged in some types of abuse, and now therapy segment of 10 minutes is over, it's time to take some more shots. And usually, do you know how many shots these kids will make? Zero, none because they have sculpted out the reality of them as a failure in their minds, in that point, Mm -hmm. in that moment, within 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. It has changed, literally changed and reduced their abilities. Therefore, what we recommend 
is approach it with evidence. Mm-hmm. What have I done to prepare myself for this ball tournament, for this test, for this speech, for this uh, whatever uh, goal I have? What have I done? What is the evidence here? And then go with the evidence. What evidence do I have that I'm going to fail? Do I have a me-sized time machine that I could jet myself as if I'm one of the Jetsons into the future and see myself failing, and then I come back and I tell myself, yep, you screwed up. You're a failure. Big, big, stinking failure. Well, no, you can't do that, so you don't know that you would have failed, but if you program that ahead of time, you astronomically, exponentially increase the chances of, of not doing well. Better to paint a different picture. And when I say paint a picture, uh, and here's, again, a little bit of the neuroscience of it, we literally are painting a, you know, name your famous artist, uh, 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 Michelangelo, uh, whoever. Bob Ross. Who? Bob, Bob Ross. Ross. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, the guy, whoever. Mm-hmm. Uh, of yourself either succeeding or failing. And, and, and you have imprinted that in your mental network. Why would you choose to paint a picture of yourself as a failure when you now know it has such power? Uh, what are your thoughts? No, that I actually have an example of that um, from, gosh, was that yesterday or the night before last? Uh, I was doing laundry, and um, I went to go check on the dryer because I usually take the T-shirts out sooner so they don't get, you know, worn out. And I noticed that my dryer had turned off, but there was still 20 minutes left that it should have been, you know, working. And so I pressed the button, nothing happened. Pressed it again, opened the door, shut the door, pressed it again. And I was like, uh, hey, honey, I think I think our uh, dryer has gone out or something. And so he came in and looked at it. He pressed the button, did everything I did. And he was like, oh, my goodness, oh, no. And so, of course, my first thought was, oh, no, our dryer is just completely toast. We're going to have to get a new dryer. Um, and then I was thinking, well, you know what, but what, what can I do about this? So I got on YouTube. And I looked up, like, common problems with dryers and found a video that was, like, three things that it's possible have messed up on your dryer if um, if it doesn't start, if it's just the start button, which that seemed to be the problem. So I looked into it. It, it ended up being um, I borrowed my husband. He's a electrician apprentice. I borrowed his multimeter and tested a couple things, and I found out it was the thermal fuse in the back of the dryer, which is about six bucks for three of them on Amazon. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so that's, that's you know, it, that could have gone completely different because if I would have just catastrophized the situation, you know, called in a mechanic, it would have been, you know, a hundred plus dollars to find out that you need a, you know, a six dollar part off of Amazon. <laughs> so it could have gone very differently. <laughs> and, and that's great because, uh, my life motto, and we're going to put a T-shirt of this, a Therapy Bites theme T-shirt and coffee mug. I'm not sure if we have it up there yet, but we've been planning on it. We, we love coming up with new grand ideas of <laughs> T-shirts and merchandise on our uh, Therapy Bites store. Mm-hmm. Everything is figure outable. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah Everything is figure outable. Number two, though, you don't have to figure it out right now. Mm-hmm. I will go to bed many nights. How are we going to do this? How are we going to do that? Gosh, I don't know. But just asking my brain the problem, uh, uh, the question about the problem, puts my brain to work, puts my neurons to work on that. And it, gosh, it, it amazes me. Now, some things have taken days, weeks, months, uh, but everything is figure outable. What have you guys discovered along those lines? Oh, goodness. Uh, an example just this past week. You know, my my husband and I took a little trip to Florida, and we learned something new. We learned that um, when you book a hotel room, if you don't let them know by 11.59 that you're going to be there after 11.59, your room gets given away to somebody else. So we we got there about 1 o'clock in the morning just to find out that, sure enough, they'd they had given our room away to someone else. (laughs) And and so at that point, it was kind of like, okay, we're... What are we going to do tonight? And and it was figure outable. You know, we we already had things in plan. Like, well, you know, we could stay at a at a rest area and sleep in the car. I mean, that's a possibility. There's lots, a lot of truck drivers doing that, so it felt safe. You know, it was always okay. Or 
you know, we ended up finding another place to stay, which was really neat. At 2 o'clock in the morning, we found a place that had vacancies, and it all worked out. Wow. And it was figure outable. Mm-hmm. We, uh, we didn't get upset. We didn't, you know, we didn't catastrophize. We didn't, oh, no, oh, no, oh, no, and let mm-hmm. it ruin the trip. Yeah. We, actually, we actually laughed about it. It became something well, and, and I want to point out what you're doing is it, 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 it's, it's not quite as easy as we just didn't get upset. There has to be a lot of cognitive programming mm-hmm. that goes on before the we just didn't get upset. Yes. There is no yeah. magic in this. Mm. Of, no. We just didn't get upset. <laughs> right. And Debbie kind of <laughs> indicated that when she talked about how they decided to think about it. And that step, one of those steps was, hey, we can figure this out. Uh, Step number two, how big of a catastrophe is this? Is it a level 10? Is it a level two? Is it a level 0.02? You get to decide how catastrophic something is, but beware that that decision, how you decide to think about it, how I decide to think about it, is going to make all the difference in what emotions are produced simply, strictly, solely based on how you're deciding to think about it. Which leads us now at the end of our show, because we're about out of time for today, uh, that neurobiology of the magic of making matters worse. Imagine a grizzly bear comes out of the woods. Uh, I've never met a grizzly bear. I never hoped to meet one, but I can tell you anyhow, I'd rather see than be one. That uh, comes from the Purple Cow poem in Nursery Round books that I read as a kid. Um, but what happens is your brain identifies the grizzly bear as a threat, and then your brain starts doing a number of very interesting things. It leverages norepinephrine, it's kind of like jet fuel in your bloodstream. Uh, it sends a signal to shut down different things in your body and turn on different things. One of the things that your brain shuts off when you're telling yourself there's a level 10 or level 9 or 8, 7, 6 catastrophe is it shuts down blood flow to your stomach. If you ever wonder why I get so sick at my stomach in a tense situation, it's because you've told your stomach to do that. You just didn't know it. It happened at the level of implicit processing. I am dot P dot imp. It's a little demon. Uh, implicit processing that happens beneath your level of conscious awareness. If you don't want your stomach to shut down, then stop telling yourself that this is a level 10, 9, or 8, or 7, or 6 catastrophe. It may be non-preferred, but non-preferred does not equal catastrophic. And then there's a whole host of other things, increases in cortisol, changes in blood flow from one part of the brain to the other, from mainly the frontal lobe to more central core amygdala. And why? Because you told yourself that not getting a hotel room, if it's Debbie's case, or me, not getting checked out at the store as rapidly as I would prefer has become the same over simulation, has become the same as a grizzly bear chasing me through the woods and he's going (laughs) to eat my legs and he's a zombie grizzly bear and he's going to eat my brain. It's a zombie grizzly bear. He's eating legs and brains. Hurry, run away. Well, goodness. (laughs) <laughs> Why would I do that to myself if I have a choice? Mm-hmm. And that's what we want to leave you with today. You have a choice. Mm-hmm. Are you going to uh, grizzly bear it or <laughs> are you going to decatastrophize it? <laughs> Just because it's what I don't prefer, <laughs> are you going to be catastrophized? And there's a joke that y'all are going to have to tell me later because I just missed the whole thing. I guess it's on screen. Sarah's popping up funny things on the screen there. Oh, no, I oh, just no. got it late. Oh, you <laughs> got it late. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It went over my head. And Better then late than that. Yeah. 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 Kind of like, oh, okay, wait. thank you for joining us today. Uh, catch the next episode. Bye, bye, bye. <laughs> Hey, T. Balders, Dr. Heath here with your secret side disorder of the day. There is a syndrome, a phenomenon, a psychological disorder that many of you may not be familiar with, and it is called derealization. In instances of uh, severe or acute stress or abuse or with PTSD, patients often report derealization and depersonalization. Let's take derealization. Uh, This is the 
phenomenon of thinking that I am detached or somehow not connected with the reality of what's out there. I'm, I'm disconnected from that. It is really uh, kind of something that is meant to keep us safe. If you're undergoing a severe traumatic event, if you can disconnect yourself from that, then somehow that engenders the belief that you're more safe because it's not really you engaging in that event, situation, circumstance. But here's the problem, and I challenge you guys, do some Googling. I don't often say that, but I challenge you to do some Googling because what you will find are those that talk about this phenomenon, they get it wrong. How do they get it wrong? Because they label it as a feeling of derealization. There is no feeling of derealization. There are emotions and there are feelings, and those consist of happy, sad, mad, glad, disgusted, ashamed, stressed, depressed, anxious, angry. None of those emotions are evidence that you are detached from reality. The problem is if you start to connect an emotion with an experience, then every time you have that emotion, then you'll believe that you're once again having that experience. Here's a better idea. Ground yourself in your thinking. Ask yourself, what am I thinking in the moment? The more you focus on your thinking, the more you can increase the health of what's going on inside of your brain. What are some nifty ways to do that? I'm here sitting on a couch. I'm talking into a camera. I can feel the glasses on my face. I can feel my fingertips. Therefore, no matter what other feelings you're having, you can know that you're still here, that you still exist, and mostly, you can know that you're still safe. There is no emotion that means that you're not safe. Yes, there's some difficult emotions, but none of those mean that what's out there has become unreal. None of those mean that you have become unreal. They're simply emotions that you can observe like clouds passing in the sky. And like clouds passing in the sky, you can let them just float on their way and radically accept their course across the view of your experience. Think about it. And now it's time for the psych quote of the day. Today's psych quote is by Carl Jung. Mistakes are, after all, the foundations of truth. And if a man does not know what a thing is, it's at least an increase in knowledge if he knows what it is not. Hey, T-Ballers. Thanks so much for being with us today. If we brought value to your day, show us some love by leaving your positive feedback and inviting some friends to listen in and join the T-Ball team. Next time on Therapy Bites Art Lab. Why must I not be angry? Do I have to go through my entire life not experiencing a very human emotion called anger? I mean, do I need to go to the hospital and have an angerectomy? Do I need to have the anger police come and arrest me and put me in anger jail? Hey, this is Dr. Heath. That's just a little display that most people think should not be allowed in relationships because others think that it is so threatening. Today, we're going to tackle one of our high value targets What's the problem with anger? Coming up next.